Well, we have spent the last two months in a series called Unwrapped. And we have two more weeks in this series, but it's taking on a major shift and change today. Now, I'm going to do a... I don't even have a title for today, really. We're going to do kind of a conclusion or an epilogue, if you will, to the motivational gifts. And if you're a guest today, you are coming in at the very end of a long, a two-month series about spiritual gifts. So quickly, I just want to kind of catch you up as best as I can. It's a lot of material. Um, But when we talk about spiritual gifts in the New Testament, we have one English word, and it's simply gift. But in the Greek that it was written, there's actually three different words for gift. And so there's actually three different categories of spiritual gifts. And we've spent the last two months talking about the first category, the motivational gifts. The motivational gifts. Now, these gifts color our worldview. These gifts are given to us before we're even born at conception. We are wired with these things. They affect how we communicate, how we see the world, how we deal with our boss, how we deal with our kids. Our kids have these gifts, and that's why they're so different. And there's seven of these motivational gifts, and I'm going to close that out today. We're going to talk a little bit how all that works in the body of Christ. And then the second category is the manifestation gifts. Those are found in 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to begin the foundation to talk about those today. We're going to talk just a little bit about finishing the motivational gifts, and then we're going to move right into talking about the Holy Spirit and setting a foundation for next week, which, by the way, you cannot miss next week. If you have a vacation, you need to just push it one more day. Um, It's that important. It's that important. You really do need to be here next Sunday. And then the third category are the ministry or positional gifts that Jesus gives to the church. Three different categories, three different Greek words. Before I begin teaching on the Holy Spirit and the manifestation gifts, I want to conclude our study, like I said, of the motivational gifts with this scripture, okay? And you can take notes on the back of that sheet as as usual. Ephesians 4, 16. Look on the screen. He makes the whole body... Fit together, what? Perfectly. As each part, somebody say each part. As each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow. So when one part is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, it actually hurts another part. But when it actually is doing what it's supposed to do, it helps the other parts grow. Grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Does that sound good to anybody else? Does that, about 10 of you, does that sound like a church that you would want to attend? Yes. Amen. Each person doing what they are gifted to do, each per- person doing what they've been called to do, not what they've been pressured into or talked into. Oh my goodness, I'm preaching now. Talked into doing by the pastor or by another leader, not feeling guilty about saying, no, I'm not good at that. You Trust me, you don't want me with the babies. They don't like me, and I don't like them, okay? Trust me, it's, it, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And the result of that kind of church, the Word of God says, not Alan, the Word of God says, is a healthy, growing, life-giving church that's full of love. I don't know about you, that's the church that I want to pastor. That's the vision of this church. That's the philosophy of ministry that I have and that we can have together. And that's why we're doing this. And discovering our motivational gifts, that first category, is vital to that. As we discover those things and not just stop there, but give them back to God, as we've been doing. Dedicate them back to God. And you know what that means? It means you have to actually use them. Oh, I'll just give it to you, Lord, and then you just do whatever you want. No, what that means is you're giving it to him so that then he can use you in those areas that he's gifted you. No more sitting on the bench. Oh, got one. Uh, thank you, Pat. 
Thank you, Pat. I'm going to go back. If, it weren't, if you weren't so far away, I'd come give you a high five, but I'm too old. Come on. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. I'm talking about no more sitting on the bench. If God has redeemed you, do you not think he's worthy of your life and your gift? Don't be like that servant who went and buried it in the ground. That's why I've been taking the last two months of our year to teach these gifts one at a time so that hopefully and prayerfully you would have that moment that God speaks to your heart. Don't let that go. Just because the series is over, use it. Use it on your job. Use it with your kids. Kids, use it at school. But use it here and use it in the world. In Jesus' name. So what does that look like in the body of Christ? Where does your gift fit in? Everybody get your cute little hand out. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. This is not a little boy with a dress on, okay? Okay. In the original, you might be able to still see it in the light. There's a, there's a line there. It's not a dress. It's not a skirt. It's, 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 it's pants, all right? So just n nobody panic. I'm not sure what's going on with his hair. I don't know what that is, but uh, maybe it's alfalfa. We'll just, maybe we'll just call him alfalfa. This, was just, this is just a funny little thing to be able to see the body, okay? All right. What we're going to do is, is, is uh, if you could, team, if you'll put up the slide with all of the, the gifts... There we go. There's all seven of the gifts. Um, these are not in order. These are not in order, so don't start writing, okay? But you have blanks, and we're going to play a little game, and I want you to respond to me, okay? This is kind of like a quiz. Now, if you haven't been here, if you're coming in at the end, or if you haven't been here, you might be a little bit handicapped in this. That's all right. Just, just take notes, and we'll be all right. So we're going to look at these one by one. That first line there is pointing so not the head, but the mind. So put in parentheses, the mind. Which of the gifts, based on the teaching, would you think would be the mind of the body? The mind. And listen, don't, don't worry about putting out a name. I want, I want to hear. So, which one? Perceiver. Think about perceiver now. Administrator is a good answer, but it's not the one I'm looking for. Teacher. That's right. Teacher. Remember, the teacher is more of the academic type, the researcher searching for truth, and then, of course, they, hopefully, if the top gift, they would then teach the truth that they research, but they're the ones logical, da 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 da, -da down the line, so teacher is the first gift. If you have the teaching gift, you need to start using it. You need to start using it. How, pastor? Well, maybe it's teaching a small group. Maybe it's, getting involved, maybe it's getting involved with our kids. Our children need volunteers downstairs. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> I heard her voice. I didn't even see it. They need help. They, how about the students, student ministry? Using that gift with them. Okay, I'm, I, I, can't take, I can't take too much time with each one because we've got to move on. The next line, the eyes of the body. Who's that? Perceive. Perceiver. That's right. The perceiver has the best ability to be able to spiritually discern things and see things for the body. Spiritually. We're not talking physically. We're talking spiritually. The perceiver has the greatest impact, has the greatest potential to make an impact spiritually in the kingdom of God. But they also, if they're polluted, if they haven't dedicated that gift to God, if they're operating outside of God, have the greatest potential to be damaging. Why? Because you have clouded vision and you're going to run somebody off into a ditch. Amen? That's the second. So the eyes, put in parentheses, the eyes. The third is easy. It's the mouth. Just think about one person that stands up here on this stage. Exhorter. That's right. The exhorter is the mouth of the body <laughs> and is the encourager. They are the extrovert. They are the ones that we want greeting people and, and smiling and encouraging. Yes. And Cody is our greatest example. So then we have, I'm sorry, this little boy doesn't really have shoulders. It's just kind of a, anyway, that's pointing to what would be shoulders. What, what, what gift would that be? I, matter of fact, the big idea I gave you, gave you the answer for this one. The administrator. The administrator 
carries the weight of leadership, the shoulders. All right, this next one, it should be the easiest one on the whole page. The heart is what? Compassion. Compassion. <laughs> That's right. Compassion. The compassion person has the biggest heart in the body of Christ. The next one, that's a, it's pointing to his arm. What would that be? Not the server, the giver. That's right. And that one's not as, as good of an illustration because it's like, what's the arm? But what, what I want you to remember about that, think about the giver because they have a heart for evangelism. Remember, they're all about evangelism. So think about the, the giver as, as providing the arm of outreach or the arm of evangelism to the world. And then, of course, we're run out of, of gifts here, so we know what the hands are. They are the server. The server loves to use their hands behind the scenes and help and serve in any capacity. Let me just say something before I move on. Do not allow the enemy to let you compare your gift to somebody else. There are no two servers alike. There are no two administrators alike. There are no two perceivers. Just because you may have the same gifting at the top does not mean you are the same at all. We are all unique. There are no cookie cutter Christians. Somebody say amen. God has created us unique. Yes, there's only seven gifts. But just because you have the same gift as somebody else, God wants to use you in a unique way. Way That is so important that you hear that. Now, if you'll notice, there's, there's a dotted line that's above the heart and below the shoulders. I want you to look at 1 Peter 4.10. They're going to put it on the screen, and we're going to add the verse 11. We've been reading 1 Peter 4.10 every single week for two months. It's Peter talking about the motivational gifts, but we're going to read the verse after that. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. We've read that for two months. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Look back at your sheet. You'll notice that there's four gifts above the line and four, three gifts below the line. Those gifts above the line are what Peter's talking about, the speaking gifts. The speaking gifts. Normally a teacher, top teacher is going to have a speaking gift, right? The perceiver definitely is not short on words most of the time. They're going to let you know. The exhorter, obviously, is going to use their mouth. And then the administrator is a leader, and they have to be able to have a speaking thing. Now, under that line, we have the compassion person. We learned last week that that person usually works behind the scenes. They're quiet, meek most of the time, non-confrontational, and they just have a heart for people, the hurting especially. And then the giver uh, the giver, I, I could see them, though, as, as both sometimes. Because sometimes I've seen, I've seen pastors of large churches that their top gift was giver. And obviously they're speaking. But they usually are using the gift, the next gift, as teacher or administrator. They're using, they're operating in that second gift. So normally the giver would fall into that non-speaking but helping category. And then the server, of course, likes to work behind the scenes with their hands and be that support. Does that make sense to everybody? So you've got two categories under the seven. So we have the speaking gifts and the helping gifts. And listen to me, everybody look at me. They're all needed in the body of Christ. Paul says in Ephesians, our scripture, as each part, not one is more important than the other. We tend, in our humanness, look at what happens up on the stage as that's the most, it's not. Come on, somebody, it is not. Every gift is just as important as the other, and if one is not operating, and you're thinking, well, nobody really sees this, so what's the big deal? Then the other parts suffer. Do you understand how important this is? Do you understand that most churches in America do not operate this way and suffer for it? I'm wanting some response. Are you, are you getting this? This is important. That's why I said it's time to get off of the pews 
Yes, we have our church and we do this. We're not going to stop doing this. But it's time that we all link arms and start using the gifts that God has given for his glory. I'll give you an example. Doug is not here. Doug Moyer. Um, who knows Doug? He's, he's a carpenter. He's a server. Definitely server. And he, he put something on, on our Facebook page, New Life, and then also his own page about one Saturday a month. One Saturday a month getting a group of people, men and women, boys, girls, whoever will, to go and help widows in their housework and in, in, in fixing their house up and just different things, having projects once a month. That's what I'm talking about. What if we all got that excited about this? It turned everything upside down. I'm telling you, I've got to move on. My goodness, I've got to move on. No cookie cutter Christians. Does that make sense, the, the diagram and everything? All right, now we're going to move on. We're going to kind of shut the door a little bit to the motivational. We're going to move on to that second category. But to do that effectively, I want to give us an introduction to the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. This is going to be, this would be good if you could write notes on the back there about this and then, and then check, check them out during the week. Go study on your own. Pray about it during the week before next week comes. This is a foundation to next week's teaching about becoming a conduit for the manifestation gifts to flow through our lives and to affect this world for his glory. Now, the first thing I want you to hear when talking about the Holy Spirit is what the Holy Spirit is not. The Holy Spirit is not a mist. The Holy Spirit is not a ghost. Wait a minute, the Holy Ghost? King James. All right, now, I, don't be offended at me about King James only. There's a lot of folks that believe King James. The problem is that translation came from 1611. And when you, when you use a word like ghost in our modern time, that's a negative connotation. I mean, I'm scared of... Come on, help me. I'm in a haunted house, and I might see a... Is that, the, is that what we want to think about when talking about the third person of the Trinity? No, the Holy Spirit is not a ghost in the sense that we think about today. The Holy Spirit is not a vapor. The Holy Spirit is not a force. This is not Star Wars. Come on. The, the Darth Vader is not the devil. Luke Skywalker is not Jesus. I've heard that. I know. Anyway, all right. Everybody meaning good, meaning well. And listen to me. Everybody look at me. The Holy Spirit is not weird. I think that's one of the biggest lies the devil uses to keep people from experiencing the fullness of the gift of the Holy Spirit. That he's going to make you if, you, if you lay down your, your, your wall and you receive everything from the Holy Spirit, that he's going to make you weird. Let me just let you in on something. Look at the screen. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird. You make you weird. Come on, laugh a little bit. I know it's early. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird. You make you weird. We're all weird. Come on. You know that Pentecostal person that you think is so weird? They were weird before they got the Holy Spirit. If you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, if you allow yourself to become a conduit for the manifestation gifts, the Holy Spirit will not make you speak in tongues to the Walmart cashier. That would be weird. And not useful at all. I mean, Paul says it in the Word. He says, you know, be, be, come on, use your brains. Don't speak, I'll just always speak in tongues. It's not going to be useful. Does this make sense? The Holy Spirit is not a mist. The Holy Spirit is not a ghost, a vapor, a force, and he's not weird. Look at the screen. The Holy Spirit is a person. And people, a person wants a personal relationship. The Holy Spirit wants a personal relationship with you. Now, I'm not sure your background when it comes to teaching 
on the Holy Spirit. If you come from a Pentecostal background, you've had a lot, right or wrong. <laughs> you've had a lot. If you come from a non-Pentecostal background, you probably, or you're new to church, you probably haven't had as much teaching on the Holy Spirit. Now, your former pastor in that non-Pentecostal church or leader would argue vehemently against what I'm about to say, but they, they either purposely or subconsciously avoided Acts chapter 2. It just sort of whoop, just whoop, <laughs> let's skip over it. I'm just saying. Now, I probably shouldn't do this. I'm breaking all kinds of church growth rules, but I'm curious. How many do come from a Pentecostal background? Just raise your hand. How many come from a non-Pentecostal background? It's about half and half. That's, I love that. I love New Life Church, folks. I do. Because it's mixed. It's, 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 it's awesome. I just love that. Here's the deal. Everybody look up here. I'm not going to teach a Pentecostal doctrine or a non-Pentecostal doctrine about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do my very best with prayer and probably sleepless nights to teach you a New Testament doctrine of the Holy Spirit. How about that? Amen. How about what the Bible says? Amen. And then you can take it up with him. What the Bible says. Now, I've been in this thing I'll just say, well, I've been in it longer than 25 years, but 25 years since Bible college as a volunteer, and most of that was full-time ministry, 21 years. And here's what I've noticed. You know, I went to a, I grew up at, at Mount Perrin. Yeah, woo, down the road, which is a Pentecostal church. I went to Lee University, which is our flagship church, I mean, school. But my master's, is from a Baptist theological seminary on purpose. So I wanted to, to be balanced and hear everything. And do you know what? We're on the same side, folks. We're on the same team. But here's what I've noticed in, in all those years. The non-Pentecostal traditions tend, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the non-Pentecostal traditions tend to kind of leave some things out. The Pentecostal traditions tend to add a little too. Okay? Do y'all trust me enough that for the rest of this morning and for next Sunday to briefly lay aside what you've been taught? Don't, 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 don't throw it away. Don't panic. But briefly lay it aside and listen carefully to what the Bible has to say about this subject. Is that a deal? Is that a deal? Come on. Now, if you go to New Life, I've probably earned that. If you don't, I haven't. If you're a guest, be skeptical. You better check everything I say in this book. Enough said. I want to pray before we go any further. Father, in Jesus' name, I rebuke any, any, any confusion that the enemy might have. The enemy does not want us to be, to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And we've, some of us have been given not enough and some too much. <laughs> God, I pray for a balanced look from your word about your Holy Spirit. Would you help us this morning? Would you make it clear and let there be no confusion in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, so if the Holy Spirit is a person, look at the screen. Who is this person? Who is this person? How many agree? Again, I'm, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. How many would agree the best resource to find the answer to that question is not a, is not, is not a pastor, is not a scholar, is not uh, you know, uh, some high and mighty teacher somewhere, but how about Jesus? You agree that Jesus would be the best source. He teaches us about the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look to Jesus 
for these answers. And we're going to look in John chapters 14 through 16. And in these chapters, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples about the Holy Spirit. And he's basically telling them two things about in, in these chapters that's about to happen. Number one, he says, I have to go away. I have to go away. That's the first thing he's basically telling them. I have to go away. I can't stay here any longer in the form that I am as a human being. But number two, the Father is sending someone to take my place. The Father is sending someone to take my place. He says, I can't stay here like I am any longer, but don't worry, because the Father is sending someone else. Now, he was telling them that as good news, to be encouraging to them. They weren't taking it that way. Think about it. Jesus was their Messiah. They had laid everything down, their livelihood. These men had spent countless hours, days, months away from their family following Jesus. Three years they had given up for this man. And now he's saying, I'm going away. And so a lot of, the, a lot of that through there is them going, well, we'll go with you. Just tell us where you're going. Just, just give us directions. And we'll go. He said, where I'm going, you cannot go. This did not sit well with them. But he said, I'm sending someone else. But they're like, how can that be good news? How can it be good news, Jesus, for you to leave us? Look at John 14, 16, and 17. Look at the screen. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Everybody say helper. helper. Say it again. Helper. To be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. Everybody say, with you. But notice it says, and will be in you. The first thing Jesus teaches us about the Holy Spirit, look on the screen, the Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. That word can also be translated comforter, encourager, advocate, in the Greek, the Greek word is paraclete. Paraclete, not parakeet. That's a different thing. Paraclete means to come alongside. To come alongside as a helper. Everybody look at me. Why wouldn't we want that? Why wouldn't we want that? Why would we keep that person at arm's length? Why would we be afraid of that person. We shouldn't be. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come down and he would anoint a specific person for a specific time, for a season, for a job, for whatever God was doing. He would anoint that person. But when that job was over, when that season of time was over, the Holy Spirit would lift off of that person. It's all through the Bible, the prophets, David, Solomon, all of those, you, you read about that. But Jesus is saying here that the Holy Spirit is with us and will be in us. How long? Forever. Say it again. Forever. Forever. Folks, that's good news. That means, look at the screen, that means we never have to be alone. We never have to be alone. Even in the middle of the night when you wake up in, my God, when you wake up in cold sweats and you feel like there's a demon in your room, if you feel like something's coming against you, all you have to do is cry out the name of Jesus and his Holy Spirit is right there. He never left you. He will never forsake you. He will be with you always, even until the very end. You can never be alone when you have the Holy Spirit. My God. Thank you, Jesus. That's good. News, why wouldn't we want that? Oh, I feel you, Lord. The Old Testament saints never had that opportunity. It is only because of the blood of Jesus Christ that we have that chance and that opportunity. Why wouldn't we want to take it? Also notice that Jesus used the word him three times and he once. Folks, you don't call a vapor him. You don't refer to a mist as, it, as, as he. Jesus is clearly teaching the Holy Spirit is a person. 
Finally, in this verse, I want you to notice that when Jesus says the Holy Spirit dwells with us, but with you, excuse me, but will be in you, he's alluding to the day of Pentecost when they are going to be filled with the fullness, the gift, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, that word Pentecost and Pentecostal, half of the room are like, whoop, maybe. Now, you're here, so maybe you're, you're, you're feeling a little better about it. But listen, Pentecost just means 50. Don't be afraid of the word. It's 50 days. It's a festival that happened 50 days after Passover. Jesus was crucified at the same time the lambs were being slain on Passover. And Pentecost happened 50 days later when the church, when they were, the 120 were gathered together and were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's all that means. Don't be afraid. Folks, don't be afraid of this. So the first thing we need to know is the Holy Spirit is our helper. Courager, advocate, comforter. Look at John 14, 25 and 26. Look at the screen. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, there's the second time he uses that, the paraclete, the one who comes along, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. So in this text, First thing I want you to see is that all three persons of the Trinity are represented. You have the Holy Spirit. Come on. I know this is teaching, and just just stick with me. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in Jesus' name. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity, woo, that's tough. That's one of the toughest things to comprehend. Somebody called me this week about it. One of the toughest things to comprehend in the entire Bible. Let me just let you in on something. We never will get it all. We never will fully understand it. Here, let me me tell you why. Look at the screen. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are in such unity that they are one God. And we can't fathom, we can't comprehend that kind of unity. You hear me? We can't get that. We can't understand that. But it's in the book, right? We just read it. It's all through the New Testament. So we know it's true if we believe the word. So we have to let that truth resonate in us, not through reason or logic, which I'm a teacher. Hello. Tough. It's tough. Not by reason, not by trying to figure it out, but by faith. We have to let these things that we don't fully understand but that are so clear resonate in us and receive them by faith and not reason and not logic. Folks, sometimes God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes God works in ways that are not logical. Just read. Just read it. And we have to receive it by faith. There's a couple other spots. Real quickly, I'll I'll highlight where the Trinity is represented. The baptism of Jesus. John baptizes him and he comes up out of the water and the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of, he wasn't a dove, in the form of a dove and lands on Jesus. Then the Father speaks from heaven. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then, of course, in the Great Commission, Go ye therefore into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have different roles, different characteristics, but they are so perfectly unified that they operate as one God. Now listen, this movie that's come out, The Shack, y'all are bracing, aren't you? Like, is he going to be forward or against it? Oh, God. Let me, let me say this. I enjoyed the movie. Is it a theological treatise? No, it's not the Bible. It's not the Bible. But I do think they do a lot right. I do think it's helpful, especially for those who are going through extreme grief. They don't back down from the hardest questions on this 
planet, and I think they get a lot of it right. I would have liked to have seen more emphasis on salvation. That would be my critique. But they, they don't, they, 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 they show the Trinity, and I think they did a pretty good job with it. Again, it's not the Bible. It's, an, it's, entertain, it's, it's a movie. But I'm thankful. I think I was really worried about it, to be honest, because I did read the book, and, and it could go either way when they made the movie. Really, honestly, depending on who got their hands on it, it could have really, really been damaging. I don't think it is. Also notice that the text that we just read, the Holy Spirit says he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the teachings of Jesus. Everybody look at me. For that to happen, we have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. When you read your Bible, and I know you are, woo, if you're not, you need to, okay? When you read your Bible, don't just open it up and start. Pray that the Holy Spirit would open those words and give you a rhema word, a right now word as you read. And he will. And then pray that the Holy Spirit would guide your day, lead you, use you to help somebody else. Do you know that if you will pray, Holy Spirit today, use me to touch and to help somebody else. Do you know that's a prayer that he's going to answer? Come on, somebody. That's a prayer he's going to answer every single time if you are sensitive to him. That's what we're talking about here. How many have had that experience where you're trying to help a friend and a scripture verse pops into your head? Maybe one you didn't even really memorize. And it's like, where did that come from? Well, that scripture didn't just pop in your head. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Or how about when you've had to try to make a really difficult decision? You prayed about it. Maybe you fasted, and then suddenly there's a story, or there's a scripture verse, or there's a friend that comes and talks to you, and that's the confirmation you needed to make that difficult decision. That is not by accident. That is the Holy Spirit at work. And it can, it doesn't have to be a rare occurrence. Oh my, that was a whole lot better than y'all just, it doesn't have to be a rare occurrence for that to happen. Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened 10 years ago, Brother Allen. I mean, the Holy Spirit, 10 years ago? What about yesterday? Jesus wants to use us every single day. The Holy Spirit wants to grab our hand and walk with us through life's most difficult hours and on the mountaintop and everywhere in between. He wants to lead us, guide us, help us, and help other people through you. Let me give you one more scripture about how he helps us. You guys were up a little early. Just hang out. You're good. You're good. I'm still preaching. John 16, 8. And when he has come, he will convict, or let's use the word convince, the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, in our modern use of the word, again, just like ghost, convict is kind of negative because we think about somebody being convicted of a crime and going to prison. That's not what Jesus is doing. He's talking about using it about belief and persuasion. You have a conviction. Some of you have a conviction to eat clean or to eat. I wish I did, but I don't. Anyway, a conviction to diet and to exercise. <laughs> Come on, folks. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to mix in a little. This is heavy. I'm just trying to do whatever I can here. How many have convictions in certain things, just in life? Come on. That's what, that's what, the Holy, that's what we're talking about there to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. If you're a follower of Christ today, if the Holy Spirit hadn't convicted you to let you know that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, you wouldn't be saved this morning. You wouldn't be here. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's something to be thankful for. That is an act of love, not condemnation. Now remember, remember uh, Behind Enemy Lines? When I talked about the, the enemy will try to speak to us and condemn us with our sin and push us away from God. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, but to heal us and draw us to God, not push us away. So if you are feeling condemned, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's the enemy. That's how you know. 
Oh, I'm speaking to somebody right now. If it's the Holy Spirit, it's drawing you to God for an opportunity of forgiveness and grace and mercy. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And then after we are saved, after we are saved, the Holy Spirit walks with us and convicts us of things that we need to confess and get under the blood. 1 John 1 and 9 was written not to sinners, but to saints. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. If you sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit this morning or any time, Push him away. Respond. Respond in Jesus' name. He's wanting to help you. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit wants us in right relationship with the Father. I don't care what you've gone through. I don't care what you've done. He wants you to be right with God. Don't put the big idea up yet. I'm going to talk about it first. Our big idea comes from a pastor, Pastor Robert Morris in Gateway Church in Dallas. He wrote a book called The God I Never Knew. Write that down. The God I Never Knew. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. The God I Never Knew. Great book. If you really want to dive deep, order it on Amazon. I highly recommend it. I've pulled bits and pieces from from his work and from my work and from different people. But I highlighted this in the book, and I think it's a great big idea. Put that up on the screen, please. It's a quote from him. When you open yourself up to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you'll find that he helps you in every area of your Christian life. When you open yourself up, he will not cram himself down your throat. Come on. When you open yourself up to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, He will help you in every area of your Christian life. Why wouldn't we want to do that? All right, everybody look up here. I'm closing. Next week, everybody say next week. We are going to talk about what it means to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit going to talk about what it means to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to become a conduit for the manifestation gifts that we're going to talk about. I have prayed about these next two weeks. I have laid awake at night. Because I don't want anyone to be offended and leave this church. I don't want anyone to not receive what God has for you. I don't want anything in your past to keep you from your future. I know I get, I get messages like text or, or Facebook stuff when I've really gotten perceiverish in my, you know, rah, and, somebody, and, and then I'll say, I, I don't want to offend anybody, and people will text me, oh, don't apologize, brother. Well, I can't help it. I don't want anybody to to leave over this, but we're going to teach the Word of God, all of it, and we're going to offer that next week after we've taught about it. We're going to offer for those who would would love to receive that gift. If after the teaching you still are skeptical and you're just not sure, just look at me. That's okay. We are still brothers and sisters. We are still on the same team. We are still Christians. We can link arms and go forward. You do not have to leave this church over this doctrine. Becoming a conduit for those gifts are to be used in the local church, but not just, we are not baptized in the Holy Spirit so we can have good services. Now we can use those gifts inside the church, 
But Acts 1.8 says, and you will receive power so that you can be witnesses. That's one of our core values. Worship, word, walk, witness. So that you can be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, which is right here, in Samaria and Judea, which is our community, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what we're talking about. That's why we are, want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that we can be receive power to be witnesses. Galatians 5.22 says, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. You know it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. How many want that in your life? How many want that fruit to be evident in your life? We need the power of the Holy Spirit in its fullness to have those things in our life. How many want everything that he has for you? 